So welcome to our webinar series. Um, this is the first webinar in our webinar for the Victims and Survivors of Crime Week. Uh, throughout the week, we have a series of webinars that we are hosting. Um, Laura um, and myself will be um, hosting as facilitators for most of the sessions this week. And we're pleased that we're able to bring the first one on um, today on looking at the uh, financial um, vulnerability. And we have a, a live, a, sorry, a lived experience um, from uh, an individual um, that we're going to talk about. And we're pleased that uh, we have um, Detective Constable Martin Franson and uh, Christine Carr with us today to share that experience with us. So just to give some housekeeping um, before we get going, um, all attendees will be muted during the webinar just to give a little um, time for people to um, have that presentation. We do want to have you provide us some questions. Um, we would encourage you to put that in the question and answer box um, if you have that. If you have a comment that you want to make uh, regarding uh, IT or some other um, just in generality, please put that in the, the chat box. We are recording the presentation, so it will be posted on our website after the webinar in a couple of days, along with the PowerPoint presentation. We are pleased that we have an ASL interpreter with us today, Mary Ann, who will be uh, doing uh, the interpreter for this whole session. If you want to enjoy, if you want to adjust the size of the um, pictures of the presenters, you can pull across your screen. Or if you don't see everybody at the top, there's a little box that says view. If you put gallery view, you will be able to see all the presenters in the session. Next slide, Laura. Laura, next slide. So before we just do the land acknowledgement, um, we will be having you to do an evaluation um, at the end of the session. So we're just asking you to give us some feedback on this session, as well as any ideas that you might have for future webinars that we are going to present um, as well. And the contact information for our presenter will be at the end of the, um, at the webinar as well. So um, if you have any questions further on to the presentation, you can contact um, the constable, uh, Detective Constable after. So I'm gonna turn it over to my colleague, Laura, to do the land acknowledgement. Thank you, Rayanne. Uh, EAPO endeavors to honor the land and its treaties by strengthening our relationship and responsibility to them. We live and work on Métis, Anishawabek, Ojibwe and Cree territories. The presence of settlers is not neutral. It has had and continues to have devastating impacts on many aspects of life for Indigenous peoples. Many of our practices, including the way we care for our elders, the ways we educate, and our methods of creating community came to these lands through an ongoing process of co colonialism. We hold a new understanding in our interactions and our engagements with this land and its people. There is important work being done by many nations and allies to ensure the continued thriving of communities and knowledge systems. Those of us who are settlers need to recognize that our knowledge and way of doing things have not been the priority as we work towards a safe Ontario for all seniors. Thank you. Rayanne, you need to unmute yourself. So just to give a background about our organization, um, for those who are familiar, our mandate really is to stop abuse and restore respect. And we're funded through the Ministry of Seniors and Accessibility and our, um, we implement Ontario's strategy to combat elder abuse. And we do this through main, three main priorities. And those, if you can go to the next slide, Laura. Those three priorities involve uh, coordinating community services, we do training, as well as public education and awareness events. So we work across, uh, across Ontario in implementing these three priorities. Um, and through COVID, we've been doing a lot more um, public education and awareness training with um, webinars because of the um, uh, social restrictions. So you see that a lot of the sessions that we have been doing 
uh, lately and numerous of them to try to get outreach to seniors as well as service providers on important issues that relate to seniors um, and abuse issues. Next slide, please. So as I mentioned before, this is Victims of uh, and Survivors of Crime Week. So we have this series of, of lineups and uh, our first speaker um, is, uh, is our, uh, we're pleased to have a, the, our first speaker with us today to, to launch this session. The next session, our next slide, please. So we're pleased to have um, Detective Constable Martin Franson from the Financial Crime Unit of Durham Regional Police with us today. Um, so Martin is, um, he, he has learned from the experience of the senior victim of financial abuse with Ethel. Ethel um, and he's going to talk about, uh, about that story and also told by the caregiver of Christine Carr, um, who's with us and who will join us after Martin's presentation, who will share how Ethel was defrauded by the contractor and friend um, and how it negatively impacted her life. Um, I know that uh, Martin has um, been an officer for quite some time and he can give a little bit about his background um, in further detail. Um, he was in the military uh, prior to become a police officer. I've been working with Martin for a number of years in my capacity at, at Elder Abuse Prevention Ontario. So we're pleased that um, he can come and, and share this story as well as many other ones I know that he's been involved in. He has a, a great deal of passion for seniors, um, very committed to ensuring the safety and well-being of vulnerable uh, seniors in our community. So um, thank you, Martin, for joining us. And thank you for Christine for coming and sharing um, your experiences uh, of being a good friend and caregiver of, um, of Ethel over the years and um, how that is, has impacted. So I'm going to turn it over to Martin now to continue the presentation and talk about the presentation, Who Speaks When the Victim Cannot? Martin. Thank you, Anne. Thank you, Laura. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm sorry that uh, we, unfortunately, times are as they are. We have to go electronically, uh, thus I can't see you. Um, as you do have questions, I've answered a couple already. I hope they were acceptable answers, uh, but do uh, put them up and I'll do the best I can as we work our way through. Uh, thank you for joining us here this afternoon. And, and it's very important, I, I believe, especially with the changing dynamics and not only in Canada, particularly in Ontario, uh, the, the age demographics is changing the way it is that we uh, unfortunately are going to see more von, uh, persons being victimized. It's, it's just a fact. Uh, you don't uh, need to go very far beyond your cell phone to know that fraud is basically off the charts these days with all those telephone calls of claims of CRA and all that other stuff that are people are trying to do uh, with you. Um, fraud is very profitable at the best of times if I pick on a, a vulnerable person who uh, is financially more comfortable uh, than traditionally have been in the past as well, that they become even much more of a target. So what happens with uh, victims is often is the case because we are picking on those individuals, they can't speak for themselves. And that's why it becomes so important. And as you'll see the line I put up at the top there, to step in and step up. Uh, and it, it's an avenue or a means for others to look after those people in society who not necessarily are able to do so at a particular time and moment in their life. So I'm gonna cover a few things. The introduction to what's known as Project Banshee. Probably thinking, what's a Banshee? We'll go there in a sec. Introduction to Ethel. I'll give you a little insight into Ethel. We'll get a better insight off Christine, who's beside me. Um, my camera doesn't permit us uh, to be uh, at the same time. So I'll try to make that adjustment when it comes time for Christine to speak. The, just the impact uh, that victimization can have on an individual. And yes, I believe it has a major impact on their health, both physical and mental. Christine is going to, has, uh, joined us today, I'm very kind of her. Christine was uh, a very long standing friend with Ethel, uh, became her caregiver and is now, and was, and well, Ethel was with us, her advocate and definitely is. And then I'll tell you a bit more about what I believe is the importance of stepping in and stepping up. If we could go with the next one. Thank you. So what's a banshee? Well, if you're into Irish folklore, it's actually a female that if she comes knocking on your door, unfortunately, uh, it means you're about to pass. Uh, 
Banshee is, and the reason that we used it as a project name is because it was the name of uh, a ship. In fact, it was the name of two ships. And in policing it to, to project names, rather than uh, having anything specific to the work we're doing, uh, we tend to go after battleships of the past. So there was one back in the 1864 timeframe, it was a steamship. And then in World War II, it was actually a, a US uh, Banshee number two, and it was a tanker ship. So very interesting. And if you really are interested, a Banshee is a TV show of not too long ago, um, which I've only been able to find on YouTube. So Banshee itself uh, actually comprised of about basically three and a half years of my life. It involved uh, seven different investigations under one umbrella. Victimization, uh, primarily three persons, the youngest being 60, he died one month into the age of 60 and the oldest being Ethel at 89, and there was another lady in between there. But it did branch out to other people of uh, seniors that were involved in this. They just didn't come forward uh, and want to proceed. There is a charity involved in this. For those who are familiar with the uh, Ikea monkey story of a few years ago, and believe it or not, it is directly involved in this. The monkey is um, as a sanctuary and two financial institutions involved in this. Uh, initial uh, investigation, we led to uh, 77 charges and six persons being accused and um, put before the courts. The uh, case itself, uh, the outcome, it was split into two trials. And the reason it was that happened was the way the criminal justice system works is it's, it's slow and tedious. And we anticipated at the very beginning having a jury, and that's asking people, your peers, to change their life routine for a period of time, and during that time frame to come to a court every day and spend upwards of eight hours in that courtroom to judge uh, particular incidents or stuff that was presented before the courts. Uh, that's asking a lot. So what they were afraid here is because the case was so large, and just to give you an idea, it was the second largest disclosure package in Ontario, just shy of 50,000 pages, um, that they split it into two trials. And the first trial involved the charity uh, with the IKEA monkey and Apple Hockett. And from that, uh, what we got was um, two persons prior to trial made agreement and, and uh, were given uh, sentences before we actually went to the, the final level of trial, the Supreme Court, Superior Court, sorry. And uh, we ran the uh, jury trial for four people, but at the very beginning, they dropped off the fourth person. Uh, and they got a, uh, what's called a peace bond. Uh, and that lasted for a year against that person. And we focused on the three primary individuals. Uh, one known as Alexander Vugman. Ovik. He ended up getting six and a half years. Uh, a, uh, AC is Alex's uh, common law partner and mother of his children. She got 90 days conviction. And then we have a Reverend Steward from PI who got 15 months. Uh, Budimorovic is still in custody. The other two have done their time. The, we also was very successful in getting something that's known as sentencing uh, fine and lieu. And to understand a fine and lieu, it's it directly related to the sentencing process. So in the criminal justice system, you can get a uh, criminal restitution order upon conviction. The problem is, is trying to collect those funds. Very difficult to do. So what ended up happening here is that the Justice ordered a fine in lieu against the individuals. And for example, Alex's fine in lieu, I believe, is around $175,000. If he does not pay that back in 10 years, he will have to go back to jail for a period of two years. Uh, we also uh, seized a house, were able to cover off a mortgage insurer, which then was able for Ethel to get her home back. And unfortunately, part two of the court system. Uh, ended up in what's called the stain of charges. And because of COVID, we are not running the second trial, which is most unfortunate. 
So what's, that's what came out of it. So let me give you a little understanding of what's behind it and how it came to our attention. Um, actually, it was brought to my attention initially because it was a case up in Newmarket involved Alex, and I was being asked to go testify as to the character of Alex in uh, another trial, totally unrelated. It just so happened around that same time that Ethel, in the company of a few people from her church, uh, had come to uh, police and reported the fact that she believed that some uh, there had been some misappropriation of her funds. And in particular, it was brought to her attention that a mortgage had been put against her home, against her uh, knowledge and obviously her authorization. It just happened that it turned out to be within about a three week period why I was looking at this individual that Ethel had come forward. And for Ethel to come forward was probably extremely challenging for her. She had to wrestle with her inner self because a little bit of history and Christine, you can help me out on it, but Ethel um, at one time was a, uh, with the Salvation Army uh, she status of a uh, she was a lieutenant. She was during the lieutenant, so she was an officer in the uh, in the Salvation Army, an extremely religious lady. She worked for twenty five years with uh, finance ministry. Uh, she was married, but her husband had passed back in the uh, late eighties. Um, they were successful together of paying off the home that they paid, uh, purchased here in Oshawa, within six years of purchase. She was extremely mm -hmm. proud of that. And unfortunately, she didn't have a, a large uh, family uh, outside her husband and Christine, which we'll let Christine talk about in a moment. So we have Ethel coming forward, but why did Ethel come forward? It's because the church people saw something was happening in Ethel's life that wasn't normal. What that was, was basically Ethel, where she used to be the social butterfly. Ethel was the one that would drive people around on Thursdays. And I ha understand she had a little group of ladies that they would go for a drive. They just point the vehicle in a certain direction and off they go for the day. They catch lunch somewhere along the way and just enjoy that time together. Always there on Sunday, often was the one to take people to church. And unfortunately, Something I did find, uh, have found to be a commonality, is that Ethel was in a car accident at some point. And I think I stress that because I have found that in a number of uh, occasions where with the senior, that impact in the motor vehicle collision, it may, from a damage perspective, to be minor, but the actual impact on the individual uh, is quite severe and it's not measurable. And I believe that was the case for Ethel as well, because when I was looking at uh, studying Ethel and how this all came about, it was just after that. She lost her motor vehicle. She lost her ability to, uh, to drive. And thus she lost her freedom. Mm -hmm. And then all of a sudden along comes this individual. And, what I did with Ethel when I first met her was, for those police officers and those in law enforcement with us, they understand what I mean. But I did what's known as a caution statement on video. And unfortunately, something we have to do is the real people that we are interviewing today may not be the same individual that we will be dealing with tomorrow for cognitive issues, or unfortunately health issues uh, leading possibly to the demise. And if we don't take that time, and we don't do it on video, and we don't do that KGB as it's known, caution, our video will not be available. So if our you know, victim is not available, we have nothing. In fact, uh, it, a lot of fighting went on in the court with the, uh, the great job that the Crowns did to get that video in it went in and it was able to speak for Ethel when she could. Uh, so we did that video and, and uh, Ethel um, sat before me and was, I'll say oblivious to the fact that she had actually been victimized. A little build up to that was again, she's lost her freedom. She, 
her social interactions with people is now limited because she hasn't got the mobility. She's living alone. Uh, she has her home. She loved her home, wanted to be there till the end uh, on a fairly major street. And it just so happened that Alexander Vudimorovic lived just a couple of blocks away. And to get to his house, uh, one of the routes, main routes he would have taken on a daily basis would have been right past her home. And Ethel said in that interview, which I will never forget to this day, she said, he came knocking on my door, said he was a contractor and that he was working in the area. And I had a small roof leak and I needed to get fixed. She goes, but I don't think anybody else hired him. She hired him to do a roof leak. And in a very short period of time, he's now accompanying her to her bank He's standing over top of her as the ATM is being used. She said to me that she was quite concerned that he wouldn't even let the money come out of the ATM machine before he would grab the money. And as it just came out to be at the end of the day, she lost over $62,000 in her bank account to his actions. At some point, he approaches her and asks to borrow her credit card. And he uses the story that his children aren't getting fed. He happened to have a, at that time, a four-year-old boy and a two-year-old girl. And Ethel was very much about kids. Ethel never had the opportunity to have children. She had told me that in the interview. And I think that she, he was able to hook onto her from that particular perspective. So she allowed him, uh, not knowing that you cannot allow someone else to use a credit card, but she gave the credit card over. Something Alex would do though, and again, what Ethel brought out in that interview, was he would come later in the evening to visit her. Again, not living too far away from her. That bothered her. It bothered her greatly, but because she was such a lovely lady, she'd let him in. And uh, one of the things that was uh, back at the financial institution records telephone conversations. And uh, on the conversation, we could hear him giving her instructions on what to say to the bank. I hope everybody can still hear me. It looks like we froze. Yes, we can hear you, Martin. Fine. We're still good? Okay, thank you. Um, so, uh, yeah, he, was, he, he would come by at nighttime. He'd be taking her to church on a regular basis, and at times he would bring the children with him and his common-law with him. And it was the church people, in particular, one particular lady, the administration lady for the church, and started questioning as to why this individual was in Ethel's life. And that uh, lady then took it to the, uh, the good uh, reverend for the Salvation Army. And at that point is where I say they stepped up and because they realized things weren't truly uh, as they should be. And then they stepped in. And it was through those efforts that they finally were able to get Ethel to come to the police station and report with her concerns. And that leading, of course, to a couple of actions uh, the biggest one being the interview with myself. Unfortunately, I had the uh, displeasure of having to tell her that, uh, that her friends, uh, the people that she thought were very important to her, uh, were no, not her friends at all. And that she was in major financial uh, dire straits, unfortunately. Uh, she, there was a very good chance that uh, she was going to lose her home because the mortgage was not being paid. Again, she had to realize that these friends, these people that were so important to her, and the little boy that came with them was not their friends. And that, in a very short time frame, uh, led to a rapid cognitive decline. Mm -hmm. I interviewed her in March, on March 16th, 2016, and I believe by November she was in an institution, and she never recovered cognitively speaking from that. Uh, sheer shock of being told 
can't tell her. Uh, it was extremely, extremely hard for her. Um, and uh, I think it uh, probably added to her loneliness as well in the process. So what I'd like to do now is just turn the camera over to Christine Carr. And the reason I'm doing this, folks, is so they can respect Christine uh, with COVID and everything. This is Christine Carr. Hello. Um, I think this is kind of new to Christine, but uh, uh -huh. <laughs> she's going to do her best to give you a little insight into uh, uh, Ethel and then, of course, her relationship from the early days uh, right on through. I actually met Ethel before I was even born. My mother was expecting when, when they were attending the same church together in Toronto, in East Toronto. And um, Ethel was right there alongside from the moment that I was delivered right through until I hugged her and, and held her when she was when she was leaving us to go back to heaven. But either way, um, Ethel had an amazing life. She was a very strong, independent, very religious, loved the Lord, and, and really was a Bible believer and had a very caring spirit. She believed firmly in giving people a hand up she would do anything to, to help someone get their foot back into life and, and be doing well, which partly I think was a lot to being raised as well as you know her, her general spirit. Ethel loved children. Um, as Detective Franson alluded to, she had never had any of her own. And um, she, she really had a giving spirit when it came to children and to caring for them. Um, she, some of her appointments with the Salvation Army included dealing with children and, and loving them and, you know, the ultimate Sunday school teacher and everything like that. Um, my relationship with her stuck from the time we left Toronto, moved to Oshawa. It covered thousands of miles when I flew across the world to live in Britain for a time. Um, happily to say that at that time she was married to Fred and was over visiting me and checking out sheep and, and highland cattle and all the fun things that you do on holiday. Um, one of the things that really bonded Ethel and I, apart from her having looked after me a lot when I was a wee wee baby and a child, my mother wasn't well and Ethel stepped up and, and helped out with my care then. And she also, when I took sick with Hodgkin's lymphoma in 1974, Ethel was my mother's kind of steadfast help. She at that point was not in the ministry any longer, but was working for the uh, Ministry of Finance in Toronto and thought nothing of literally coming to stay with me at the hospital whilst my mother went to visit my father at another hospital. He was a war veteran and he was in Sunnybrook Hospital for quite some time. And Ethel used to come and literally sit with me, have try to encourage me to eat dinner, help me with my homework, and help the other kids that were sharing the room with me. And so we had a huge a relationship that was so many different levels. Um, she, you know, knew my family well. She knew the my first husband very well, knew our children well, and was with me through many other things. When my first marriage dissolved, she was there too. And was just a real, a real impactful person for myself and the girls and our family. And she rejoiced with us when, when I married for a second time. And we welcomed two, two daughters into the family as well. So there were the four girls and myself. So, and my new husband. So either way, um, she was very involved in church. Every Tuesday, she was at women's meetings. Um, 
She liked to play uh, the piano for many things. She did many things with the songsters that met on Thursdays for years and years. And she was very busy come Sunday. She was always at church back in the day when I was a wee girl. We were at church three times a day because there was Sunday school, adult church in the morning, and then an evening church service. And so Ethel, between that and Bible studies and baking and doing all sorts of things for everybody, was a very busy, dedicated lady. Joshua in the late 80s, um, her and Fred, they purchased their house and they had that house paid off so fast and she was so proud of the fact that she was so good with, with her finances. In fact, she was detrimental in helping me to have a really good um, feeling about what I was to do financially and everything like that. And I really thank her for that to this day because it was very helpful, the things that she taught me growing up and others. Um, past the Sunday school kids that came out of the woodwork from all across Canada and throughout Europe. It was unbelievable the number of people that contacted to say, you know, how, how much she had meant to them. So Christine, if you would, can you speak briefly about how you saw a change in Ethel between the Ethel that you knew and the Ethel met these individuals. And just a refresher there, we have Alexander Budimorovic, the contractor, and then we have Reverend Alan Stewart from PEI who comes to Ontario to do his thing. She, she met up with, with Alex when he came to her door to do contracting work for her. And suddenly this outgoing lady who was very vocal and would always um, let us know, you know, talk and, and be involved in everything was slowly not as involved in things because she was very taken up with Alex's two children and with things that were going on in Alex's life. Part of her ministry when she had been a minister had always been to, to um, try to help people through their concerns and things. And Alex had shared his concerns with her. And Reverend Stewart had shared his concerns with regard to uh, wanting to open a 12-step program at some point, which really Ethel could relate to in the sense of ministry. And so there was a huge, a huge part of her life that switched over and kind of went more to helping everybody to do with Alex and Reverend Stewart and to do with Ashley and the children. And this was going on for quite a while. Ethel didn't really realize what exactly was going on for the longest time um, in the fact that she was caring so much and doing so much. And then suddenly she started to feel like she was being demanded. I need this and I need that. And it was money that was being asked for. And it was against her her, the way she'd always operated was to give people a hand up, but not to continue because in effect of giving them a hand up was to help them, but helping them was not to continue doing all the financial things like that you needed to learn. And I feel that that really impacted her in the sense that she at some point started to be fearful of, of these late night calls and of the fact, and she felt used when she would cook a dinner for him. He would say he'd be over, you know, around four or five and he would show up at her house at eight or nine at night. By then she had been up all day, done whatever Apple did during the day, which was often a lot. Uh, she walked miles, she loved to walk and she'd be exhausted and ready to go to bed and it was perfectly timed to come in and ask her for different things or to sign documents or to, you know, loan her money or like for him to ask for money for her to loan to him. 
and it was so late and she was so tired that she would just give it and then go to bed because she was exhausted. It, so it had a great impact on her. A huge impact. It changed, it changed her from being outgoing and being very transparent to being more closed off because I think on some level she knew that what, what she was doing was almost enabling him in her mind rather than to be helping him. But yet but she was she the was victim. Frightened. Yeah. yeah. She was yeah. the victim here. And yet yeah. she came. So thank you for yeah. that, Christine. We're, we'll go back to a couple of things on how it affected you in a moment. But I understand there's a couple of questions. Maybe we should uh, deal with a couple of those. Thank you, Martin. Um, thank you so much, Christine, for, for sharing that information. It really does give us a, a good sense of who Ethel was and some of the tactics that um, you know these individuals use and the timing. I thought that was just, I actually wrote that down about how probably knew maybe of the timing of that she was more vulnerable to take advantage of, of her when she may not have the energy to, you know, to really think things through maybe before she, you know, um, provided money or funds and things or actions that she took at the time. So um, I do appreciate uh, you speaking up and, and Martin, um, we do have lots of questions. Um, and I'm just going to ask Laura to present those to you. There's some, uh, some themes, um, particularly around sort of that powers of attorney issue that I'm going to ask Laura to speak on because we have 15 minutes. and I think there's going to be a lot more questions that come up as we start answering some of those questions. So and yeah, <laughs> Thank you, Rayanne. Uh, so, Martin, uh, your presentation is oh, I lost you. Uh, is garnering a lot of questions. So, we're getting a lot of questions. Sorry, around. I lost you. Oh, we're can getting. You, a, can you hear Laura? We're getting a lot of questions around POA fraud. Uh, so would you be able to speak to that, Martin? Could you ask that question again? We lost you there shortly. Uh, uh, so, we're getting a lot of questions around. You know, how difficult is it to? Um, charge and I'm and I'm assuming convict around uh, POA fraud and it, that misuse. Thank you. Um, it's a very challenging, difficult world. It, and in fact, to uh, to understand it, I actually went to uh, Osgood Hall to learn about the civilian civil side of that to, to better appreciate it from a criminal perspective. The biggest problem is that uh, and I uh, I'm going to do my little preaching for a mm -hmm. second is people walk around and they go, I have power of attorney over my mom, or I have my power of attorney over my dad. And, and from a legal perspective, there's no such thing. It's impossible to have be a power of attorney uh, because a power of attorney is a document. Uh, we are all humans. We cannot be a document, but more importantly, and I may find like I'm kind of splitting hairs there, but more importantly, folks, it's a document that is intended to speak for you at a time you're not able to. And usually that's a very vulnerable time in your life. It is not giving power to people. It is giving responsibility to people. And therefore, by saying I have power of attorney over someone, you do not have power over anybody. And I think it's very important that we change that thinking. And, and stop using that verbiage. By law, you're actually known as an attorney, which has nothing to do with being called to the bar. But that status mm -hmm. equates you to someone responsible as our attorneys are in law and not having power over someone else. I'm not asking you to overpower me. I am asking you to help me at a time when I need my help. So. And the, these documents, the quality of them are so poor for most people because they do not realize what they are signing and the implications of what they're signing. So it's very, very important that you learn before you sign. Everybody, as far as I'm concerned, in the province of Ontario and elsewhere in Canada should, at the age of 18 or older, have a power attorney for personal continuing power of attorney for property and have a last will and testament. But just because you have it doesn't mean that someone else has it, i.e. you keep possession of the documents until the time comes. When it comes to trying to prosecute, it, we have to look at cognitivity. Were you cognitively aware at the time that activity happened? 
and we have to be able to prove that. Uh, and then we have to prove deceit and other elements of criminal code. So it, it's extremely challenging. And as police, if we don't follow certain steps and go through the thoroughness that's necessary, you will never have success in court. Um, but it is possible, I can tell you that personal experience, um, that it is very possible, um, but uh, it it's, requires a lot of work and a lot of effort. Thank you, Martin. Uh, so as we're all aware, those of us that work with seniors, it's so hard for um, seniors, there's so many barriers around seniors reporting abuse or even realizing that they've been victimized. So this is a great question here. Um, how, how did you get Ethel to realize that she was being financially abused? I see, I see seniors that get involved with people that abuse them financially and convince them that the family is the one actually being abusive to them. It's hard to get seniors to see this. How, how did Ethel uh, realize that she was being um, financially abused? Uh, that was, that's difficult. That was a yeah. very difficult situation. It wasn't until I was able to show Ethel uh, through what's called the land registry, which is your title, to her home mm -hmm. to show that there was a mortgage against her home. Remember, she had paid off her mortgage some 35 years previously uh, and worked extremely hard with her husband to do so in six years and was so proud of that. And then I, the bad cop, having to tell her, well, you now have a $150,000 mortgage on your home. And uh, through investigation, they were actually going for substantially higher funds but uh, just because of the stress test that everybody must go through for mortgages, uh, they were only able to get 150,000. Um, and it was all through deceit, lies, false pretenses. And it was that we were then able to get the insurer for the mortgage to cover off the gloss. And that's why Ethel was able to get her home eventually uh, back to her and as a sole owner. But it's, it's difficult. Um, I've dealt with a lot of people in a number of different situations who um, do not want to be told that their own children, and there are statistics out there if you're wondering, um, do you have a 24% chance of your son uh, victimizing you under power attorney, and you have a 23% chance of your daughter, uh, based on stats that I've discovered, uh, of that occurring, so one in four chance. Uh, one of your children actually uh, causing you trouble. Uh, I can't imagine there's any parent out there that wants to ever be told that their child uh, has looked at them as an ATM and their child looks at them as a means to their financial gain. And there's a, I, through experience, I've dealt with a number of people who just don't want to hear it and will not accept it. Uh, my first exposure to dealing with seniors goes back ooh, at least 15 plus years. The gentleman who should have been financially well off was about to be evicted from the nursing home and uh, his son should have been held accountable. Uh, and this elderly man is in teary eyes sitting there telling me he did not want his son to go to jail, even though he realized he was about to be homeless. Mm -hmm. Um, it, it's a very, very difficult thing to do, uh, to bring to their attention. Um, and they have to be willing, of course, um, to, to go through the process because the information they have to tell us has to be truthful and, and it has to be uh, complete and thorough. And a lot of times the parental uh, desire outweighs, as does the love of their children, which is a beautiful thing but it should go two ways and it often does not. Thank you, Martin. Another great question. Um, for those of us that uh, suspect um, a senior is being uh, frauded or financially abused by their POA or family member, uh, who exactly can call the police on these issues? Anybody can, absolutely anybody. The biggest one, and that's where the step in, step up comes into play. Thank you for that. It's a perfectly timed. Um, is if you are seeing something that isn't right, such as with Ethel, the church people saw that she's in company now with people they've never seen in the congregation before. 
the the connection just wasn't working well with them. You've got a big burly contractor uh, with little Ethel beside her, not allowing anybody else to get into Ethel's world, uh, basically isolating her, even though she's in the church. Trying so, to toss the people that were in the world with her. Yeah, trying yeah. to impart themselves yeah. on her world, yeah. um, but controlling her the whole time. Um, anybody can though, and that's the step in. You see this going on, working for a financial institution. There's a number of them around that I, I'm so proud of because they've actually stepped in and they've seen Mrs. Jones, who let's say comes in once a month to pay her bill, all of a sudden now is coming a couple times a week or is in company with someone they've not sure who they are. And when I say step in, they what they're doing is they're having that communications with them, they're that conversation with them. And some may call it being nosy, I call it being uh, caring. And you ask those questions, uh, who is that person? Nice to see you. We don't only see you so regularly, what, what's changed, uh, you know? And it's through those inquiries that maybe the hair in the back of your neck and uh, the, the, your stomach adding up here. This isn't Mrs. Jones as we know her. And that's when you step up. And when I buy that is you tell someone. The Privacy Act allows you to do it. It was changed in 2015 for PETA to permit you to speak on behalf. Uh, when you suspect a financial abuse for those who uh, are in concern of uh, privacy, but it is very, very important that you step up and that you actually take steps. And I've had people sitting there going, well, well I don't want to impart myself on that. But at the end of the day, they're very proud of the fact that they did because you ultimately have saved someone's life uh, because being abused financially and, and uh, physically were the primary uh, causes of death within five years is a finding out of the U.S., uh, a study that was done there. And I really believe it. I've had three less than three years from the time I've had to tell them they were victims. So, um, and then you have the cognitive impairment mm -hmm. that rapidly increases as well, unfortunately. So it's so important that you step in and you step up because at the end of the day, you are doing them a world of good. Thank you so much, Martin. But uh, we're just cognizant of the time here. So we do have a lot of questions that haven't been answered. So um, maybe Martin could email these individuals back, but we'll just proceed with some uh, very uh, pertinent resources. Uh, here you can see Martin's contact info and I'll pass it off to my colleague, Rayan. Thank you again, Martin and Christine. Um, there, are, as uh, Laura mentioned, there are a lot of questions and we will um, look at those and we can send them to Martin to help us answer them and um, maybe post them on our, our website following the webinar as well. Because I know there's powers of attorney is, is an ongoing, um, lots of questions in regards to that. And it, it is a very complex issue when it does get into um, looking at uh, some of the the police and investigations, because it's not, uh, as, it, as Martin indicated, it does take time for um, that investigation to take place and sometimes years, depending on the certain circumstances. Um, I just wanted to um, just reinforce that uh, not only Martin's role um, within uh, Durham Regional Police, but across Ontario, there's um, senior support officers, sometimes they're called different uh, titles and different uh, detachments. Um, but many jurisdictions now have uh, an officer that deals with seniors issues. So uh, I would encourage you, if you're calling to report a situation, ask if they have a senior officer, um, support officer or something to that effect to see, um, and chat with them about it. They may not be doing the investigation directly, but they could at least help you strategize who you need to speak with within the department um, to further your, um, your investigation or the issues that you need to have resolved. Um, the other thing is you can call Crime Stoppers and report it anonymously. Um, that is uh, available for people to do that if they don't want to come forward. Again, it's it is a part of stepping up. Um, although it, you know, talking and knowing what information you have to give your so the police can follow up with you to, if they have more um, questions is also very helpful. I think from a, I would think from a legal point of view. The only mandatory reporting we have in Ontario is within retirement homes and long-term care, and the numbers here are are listed. 
Um, we have, um, we know that uh, these issues are happening within uh, those facilities and we encourage people to, to report to those lines. It is mandatory um, law um, that they are reported um, if there are instances um, in those care situations. If you're looking for legal supports, and I know this is always a problem. I know there was a comment in the, um, the question box around accessing legal support because it can be very costly for those who may not have the financial means to hire a private lawyer. Um, if you, depending on your, your income, the, the Advocacy Centre for the Elderly is part of legal aid and they can provide some legal assistance to individuals or at least give you some advice um, uh, as well. The law referral system, law law society referral services. Um, if you go online and indicate that you need a lawyer, they can link you with a lawyer within your area you live in and the law that you require to give you 30 minutes of free legal consultation. Uh, again, it's not a lot, but at least gives you a start to know what your rights are and where you need to proceed. There's also equivalent to ACE as a South Asian legal clinic. Again, providing support um, to the South Asian community. The Office of the Public Guardian Trustee, there was a question about what the role of the POA is, or sorry, the Public Guardian Trustee. Um, I would encourage you to go to the website for the Ministry of Attorney General. There's a lot of information regards to what their role is and how they can uh, further assist in these situations. But they will look into cases where the person's at risk and does have vulnerability where they cannot understand or appreciate their situation. And lastly, there's a slider just around some support services. And I think one that uh, Martin uh, would really, I know reinforces is the Ontario Caregivers Association um, and the Alzheimer's Society that people need to reach out if they need some support or help um, to reach out and, and get those services and home care. It's okay to ask for help when we need it um, at any time. Next slide. The one slide that I didn't mention is that we do have a seat. There is a senior safety line that's uh, organized through the Assaulted Women's Helpline, and they um, they can support people on the phone. So the number is 1-866-299-1011. They now have just launched an online chat service. Um, so if you go to their website, you can actually have a live conversation with the counselor as well, which is very helpful. I'd encourage you to go to the website. We do have a lot of resources on financial abuse, the legal rights of um, individuals. Um, we're producing more as time goes on with uh, particularly unfortunately with COVID, um, but we do produce a lot of um, social media um, information that has some tips in it as well. So if you're not on our website or following us um, on social media, I'd encourage you to do so. Next slide. Yeah. I see we still have a couple of minutes, so if it'd be so kind, uh, there's a couple of things I just uh, let people know. Um, I do have a recorded seminar. It is two hours long on uh, power of attorney and last will and testament. It's from a policing perspective. It's on the DRPS YouTube channel. You just have to search that and you will see it on there. I invite you also to watch the video that's called the dementia experience. It's only 18 minutes long and it gives a the perspective of two persons suffering dementia. The first individual is only 48. Most people think dementia is a senior's uh, disease, and it is not. Um, and uh, so I invite you to, to look at those two areas. Uh, I thank you. If you do have more questions, please feel free to email me. I will get to those for you and get back to the best I can. I am not a lawyer and not an expert, but I will give you the best uh, either answer and or direction that I can give you. Um, but if you, for the last little minute that I have left, I was wondering if you'd be okay if I was to ask uh, Christina a comment about the impact it had upon her. Yes, thanks. So Christine, um, we've had an opportunity to learn a little bit about that. So we know the impact that it's had a devastating impact. You were there for her. She was there for you when you were younger. You were there for her at her later stages. Um, I can only imagine it had an impact. You went through the it trial. It was, yeah, it was, it was in a word, heartbreaking um, on so many levels to see that somebody that you love that much and that deeply can be hurt by other people who don't care, like literally don't give a hoot about your well being or your health or anything or your financial health. They just didn't care. They cared for themselves of what they could get from her 
even after she started to fail, they still continue to try to take and take and take. So the impact so on you as an individual? It's changed me. It's changed me. I am not so, so taking everybody right um, at face value. I look into things now before I, I go ahead and, and help and things like that, which has made a huge difference in me. I was always really person, but now I really look around and check into things. I also have found through this, I'm more vocal. I'm not afraid to help somebody um, when it comes to a point that I think something is going wrong because I've learned that if indeed there is something wrong, they need the help. And secondly, if there isn't anything wrong, then you, you're going to, the truth will always come out. So there's nothing to fear in helping somebody. And if you make an error, then you just have to apologize for it. But on the other hand, helping them could mean the difference between like Alpha's situation of having a home, losing a home, having a place to stay in long-term care that she could afford and living out a life, a life well lived, but not left in, in a shambles and Thank blown you. to pieces. Thank you, Christy. Thanks, Christy. Thanks. That's, you know, I think that's, you know, it, it does have an impact of all those around the individual that's had supported them and, um, and, you know, for, um, you know, being more aware and more uh, vigilant, but also now just sort of helping out where we think before we may not have sort of asked as many questions. So I would encourage everyone as part of another program that we offer similar to Martin's, you know, concept around the stepping in and stepping out is the It's Not Right Neighbors, Friends and Families program that we encourage bystanders to, you know, you don't have to solve the problem, but just ask someone if they're okay. Um, they may not have had anybody contact them prior to that or ask them the question. So, um, you know, taking Martin's advice is, is quite, and Christine's advice is, um, you know, welcomed, I think. So I just want to end thanking you both again. Um, again, I'll post these as soon as I can up on our website so people can uh, see it. We do have other um, webinars coming up as uh, Laura has been going through. Um, our last, uh, second last webinar, I think maybe for the year, is um, with the Advocacy Center for the Elderly, as I mentioned before, talking about the rights of individuals in long-term care, particularly right now with COVID. So um, if you're not on our list, uh, I'd encourage you to sign up for that one as well. And uh, just to finalize, um, again, if you want to contact us, um, our website is uh, uh, eapon.ca. Um, and you can follow us on social media as well. So thank you both again. We really do appreciate it. Thank you, uh, um, Marianne, for uh, being our ASL translator today. Uh, we do appreciate uh, you coming out and, and supporting us and providing um, this really important information to be accessible for everybody. So thank you, everybody. And um, we look forward to you attending our next webinar.